It's both a centenary to Basil Jellicoe and a tribute to Rob Inglis, who put on a musical to, called Jellicoe the Musical in, um, in 2003. A hundred years ago, in Summerstown, something rather wonderful happened. Father Basil Jellicoe arrived, and that put in motion a housing movement that transformed lives, taking people out of poverty, out of slums, into proper social housing. The St Pancras housing movement was formed, and that inspired lots of other housing movements all over Britain and actually abroad. Some of the posters you'll see bear witness to that. Um, now we are in 2021, and just over there, there's a public park and a tower block of luxury flats is being built on that. That isn't social housing, let alone affordable, or what is called affordable housing. This is why it's happening in Summerstown. And this is why me and my group are setting up a museum. And that's why we're here tonight, because of those three reasons. We want to tell that story of this wonderful cast who've all given their time to tell the story of St Pancras housing. And next year, in spring 2022, we hope to tell that story and many others in a museum in Summerstown where this began. I'd like to introduce Debbie and the cast and um, give a warm welcome everybody. because, you know, I'll, I'll never remember it. But um, I just want to do a little introduction about Father Jellico and how we all came to be doing this and being here uh, in this church uh, on the stage. Basically, um, Jellico the Musical was performed eight times over two weeks in October 2003 uh, at the Shaw Theatre along the Eastern Road, and that is 18 years ago. Um, it was written and directed by Rob Inglis, who lived in Summerstown and was well known to many local people. He was born in Australia, but had spent many years in England acting and writing works for the stage. He even formed a theatre company called the Musical Flying Squad, which performed in the community around here. Uh, I've just found out that Rob also produced a spoken version of the whole of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. <laughs> Impressive. So when Diana um, told me the sad news of Rob's death earlier this year, we thought it would be a nice idea to do some sort of a memorial, uh, a tribute in his honour. Now I played Edith Neville back in 2003, and it turned out I still had a copy of the script. Um, I'd also transferred um, the video which was taken of one of the performances. Uh, it, onto a, a DVD so I didn't lose it um, and then I put it onto YouTube uh, and uh, um, so it's on YouTube so if you want to watch the whole thing that we did back in 2003 I think if you just put in Jellico the musical you'll get there um, so the original production had a, a band uh, a cast of thousands well at least 50 they were professional and amateur actors. There were 10 teenagers from the Susie Earnshaw Theatre School and about 20 children from St. Aloysius, which is the local primary school. So I set about trying to find the original cast. Um, it was quite difficult to even find people's email addresses or I'd have to find somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. But in fact, <laughs> nine people replied to me, of which four couldn't do it tonight. One was going to, he, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Tim Heath, was going to be here, but he's playing uh, Father Christmas at the National Gallery. Don't <laughs> <laughs> you know what takes priority? <laughs> anyway, he sends best wishes, and uh, he, he, uh, we have met up recently. Um, so anyway, six of us um, um, are playing the parts that we all played back in 2003. So that's Peter and Helda and Julia uh, and Graham and me. Um, and oh, Rob Wickham, <laughs> who was a, he was a parish priest at St Mary's at the time we did Jellico. Um, he's now the Bishop of Edmonton, uh, but he's here this evening to recreate the role that he did 18 years ago, <laughs> uh, which is Father Percy Marion Wilson. 
And Father Pascal is the current priest of St. Mary's Church. And we are hugely grateful that he is going to play the role of Father Jellico. <laughs> And I wrote to Brandon and um, Abby, who is a local teenager, and two, two friends, uh, Jules and Jan, um, and so they kindly also agreed to join us. So that's the cast of 11. It's not 50, it's only 11, but um, we're all, uh, there are actually 35 characters in the piece I've edited down, um, which means that we're all wearing quite a few different hats. So, some of us have met up to rehearse a few times, um, but it seems only fair to let you know that we, this is the first and only time that we have all been together in one place at one time. <laughs> and um, so what we're going to do is basically a reading of an edited version of Act One of Jellicoe the Musical. Um, just because we can't do the whole thing. Um, but of course, because it was a musical, there are quite a few songs. Unfortunately, uh, Peter Marshall, who arranged the music and was the musical director, is also no longer with us. And we haven't got a score. We don't have any band or a musical accompaniment. Um, so anyway, it's been a question of memory, uh, trying to remember what the songs were, and uh, listening to the video of the uh, original recording. So we'll do our best. And now I'm going to tell you, this is the story of charismatic Basil Jellico, who arrived in overcrowded Somerstown in 1921 and helped transform the living conditions of people who lived here at that time. Over the next 40 minutes or so, you'll meet some of the residents, the local GP, Mog, the firewoman, various street sellers, a couple of builders and a few Somerstown mums. You'll meet the St. Pancras House Improvement Society, who started the building project rolling. There's also a scene with Basil as a young boy with his mother. In Act Two of the musical, which we're not reading, the new flats have been built with modern facilities, including bathrooms, set amongst plenty of open space. Jellico asked people what they wanted and ensured that housing was beautiful as well as functional. The sculptor, Gilbert Bayes, created fabulous ceramic finials on posts and courtyards, which were specially designed for drying clothes. <laughs> Jellicoe also made sure there was a lot of publicity about the need for regeneration of Somerstown. The first house to be demolished on the Sydney estate was blown up by a very large stick of dynamite. <laughs> and in 1932, large papier mache models of rats and bed bugs and I think a cockroach <laughs> were paraded around the streets before being burned on a bonfire on the site that became St. Christopher's Flats. So Father Jellico was really very good at um, publicity and if the social media had been going then I'm sure he'd be brilliant at that too. <laughs> Quite a few VIPs came to inspect new flats including Queen Mary, the Prince of Wales at the time and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Actors and writers were involved in fundraising, including J.B. Priestley, John Goldsworthy, John Betjeman, Flora Robson, and John Gilbert. Father Jellico even improved and ran a couple of pubs, <laughs> the Anchor and the Tavistock Arms, neither of which are, exist anymore, I fear. Although he was teetotal, he realized the local community needs a good family pub. He often served behind the bar, and he lived upstairs for a while. Unfortunately, because we're not doing Act Two, it means we won't be singing a song that I think some local residents remember from the musical, which is called A Parson Running a Pub. We'll have to come back and do that another time. <laughs> Jellico also helped solve other social problems by running nursery schools, setting up a loan club, a low-cost furnishing shop, and a children's holiday home. And his cry was that housing is not enough. You need everything. You need all the other things to support tenants. Sadly, Father Jellico died in 1935, only 36. He had delicate health, was often depressed, and no doubt worn out from his efforts to raise money for housing reform. Despite his early death, his inspirational work continued. 
The St. Pancras House Improvement Society that he started with, Edith Neville, became St. Pancras Housing Association. In 2010, it changed its name to Origin Housing, which currently owns and manages 7,300 homes across London and Hertfordshire. So some thank you. Many thanks to Diana, Esther, Brendan, and everyone who's given their time and energy to get the Summers Town Museum project off the ground. I think it's just really important, important not to forget local history and with the uh, buildings marching in from Euston and King's Cross and the Knowledge Quarter, it's very easy to forget the history of Summers Town. So well done to them for getting the museum going. And thanks to everyone for fundraising tonight. And thanks to Malcolm Holmes, Camden's archivist for background information. Huge thanks to all the actors uh, who have given their time for free. And to Kathy, who is Abby's mum, who has been such a help behind the scenes. She's been finding props and she's been reading in for all the other people who haven't been there. Um, it's been great to have the new museum space to rehearse in. And thanks to Mike and Avocado for doing the tech work and some lights. So now, it's our time to, um, for our tribute to Rob Inglis, writer, director, community activist, a very special and talented Summers Town resident. A steam train whistle blows hauntingly. I well, use your imagination, madam. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ernie Tattershall, coal merchant. I want to tell you how Father Battle Jellico <coughs> transformed Summers Town. Till he came, it was out on train wheels. The trains that come to Summers Town bring wealth from all the kingdom. But no wealth stays in Summers Town. We only get the dust and grime. Yeah, come on, you look out your buttons. Join in. <laughs> Summers Town lies in the heart of London, where the railway lines run like arteries. Squeezing the Oops, I sips 
Rust beats through the battered railings, bulging walls where hoops of iron, windows warped around broken panes, and the rotting floorboards lie in shreds down in the mud which lies below. These houses were beautiful. Long ago. It's deplorable, as is the sanitation which explains the death rate. What brings you to the gates of hell? <laughs> Edith Neville persuaded me to do a housing survey. No, oh, her. Edith had girl bossy boots. Yeah. <laughs> she is overpowering. <laughs> That's what we need. Like the new mission priest, Basil Jellico, ride his motorbike to mass. Play the accordion. Very colourful. But he gets things done. I heard he closed the mission clubs. Mm, a good thing too. They were far too unruly. He told the youngsters, we'll open again in a spirit nearer to God. Oh, here he comes. Morning, Dr Shaw. Morning, Father Basil. I hear Len is ill again. Will you recover? The bedroom's too damp. I've told the council. Serve notice on the landlord. Lenny needs another seaside holiday. Can you help? Certainly. Thank you. Dear God, can we get Lenny to the seaside? Of course we can. Back at the mission, Father Jellico was learning more about the houses in Summers Town. I want a bath. This is the mission's bathroom. You'll have to bath at home. What's in? The kettle or the sink on the stairs? <laughs> oh, when we were kids, Mum used to bath us uh, once a week, wash days, <laughs> in the back garden, in the open. My old man's a chimney sweep. He bathes every night in a tin tub. You try bathing in that water after he's been in it. I didn't know. I didn't realise. No baths in your houses. Right, it's time to use that imagination of yours again. Right, I want you to imagine that I'm wearing one of those amazing costumes of all those pearly buttons. And I'm going to tell you about Henry Croft, who was the pearly king of Somerstown when Jellico was here. <coughs> In Queen Victoria's glorious reign, I was raised in St Pancras Orphanage. Mill times I sit silently. <laughs> well behaved <laughs> from me plate of gravy. One day I saw a bright light shining up at me. And a hawk's been munching diamonds. No, it was a caster wearing pearly buttons on this right up to his knee. In a flash I saw my destiny. I'm the pearly king of Summer's Town. In my donkey cart and my pearly suit, pearly chipper and my pearly boots, I raise a fortune every year. Count on me, I'll never fail ya To bestow upon the poor Especially the little orphans Pay for the orphans, thank you There's nothing that an orphan can't do <laughs> I was raised in Sussex as my father was the vicar of St. Peter's Church, Chailey. The parsonage had a lovely garden where each one of God's creatures was my friend. When he was a knitter, even a fox was his friend, so his mum told me. And here they are together. But first of all, imagine the church bell. 
Parsonage Garden of St. Peter's Chaley, winter 1904. That little bird smiled at you, Mother. It did? Oh, yes. Let's go over to the moat, that's fine. There he is. I shall mention him tonight in the service. Pray for him at even so? I mean, after I put on my nightshirt when I speak to the maid. Well, here comes the hunt. Can you oh, hear it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Look out, Fox! Here come the hounds! Ah, 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 the matter? <laughs> the poor fox. I'll make the dogs think that I'm the fox. Keep on asking any work, governor, and you can't raise a shilling. Then you think, shall I do what I'd rather not try? Cause I'd rather my kids didn't have to starve neither. Me, I don't bother with politics. I try to ignore the landlord's tricks. I'd rather do an honest day's work than moan cause I can't find justice on earth. But my kids are starving, I ain't got a farthing. Do I sit on my arse and watch them get thinner? 
Then I tramp the streets knocking, and I keep on asking, any work, governor? And I can't raise a shilling. Then I think, do I do what I'd rather not try? Because I'd rather my kids didn't have to starve neither. Later that night, Father Jellico is sitting asleep on an upright chair in his bedroom at the Maudlin Mission. There's a stack of open correspondence on his lap. He half wakes, gazes at the letters. Dear Father Jellico, my mum broke her rib. I tried to help her, but now my sister's sick. If I had money for a black coat for my uncle's funeral, I could wear it when I asked for work. We've got another baby on the way. We've had six already, and I don't... Are you alright? There's nothing for it, Percy. I shall have to resign. Whatever for? I can't cope with Summer's Town. But you've achieved so much here. Not enough. I'm getting out. Perhaps you're being a little impatient. No. Realistic. Listen. I shall resign. Listen to me. Don't bang your head against a wall. Skip to the side and walk around it. You must never give up hope. If one door's locked, another opens. Don't let a lock discourage you. Vary your tricks like Bill the burglar, though it might not budge today. If you persist, it will tomorrow. You've done so much in this town. You've led knees up Mother Brown. Taken mums on tricks to Oxford for tea and scones there with the dons. Old friend from our maudlin days, send us generous donations led by Edward, Prince of Wales, the royal patron to our mission. So, don't bang your head against the wall. Skip to the side and walk around it. You must never give up hope. If one door's locked, another opens. Don't let a lock discourage you. Vary your tricks like Bill the burglar, though it might not budge today. If you persist, it will tomorrow. You see, you can't resign at a time like this. Why not? It's three o'clock in the morning! <laughs> All my efforts are brought to nothing by this appalling housing, this purgatory, those boys with no baths in their homes, little Lenny in again. I can see words in the sky, words that flame. There's a vision in the night sky, words that burn above the squalor. They shall build up the old ruins and repair the desolation. Does that message call me to restore the crumbled ruins and replace the map of greed with a blueprint drawn in heaven? When you mix cement with greed, you create a desolation so that body, mind and spirit lie broken in the ruins. How can the spirit thrive when the body is degraded and imagination withers like seeds in barren soil? Is that my task? Despite the odds, despite the scale, despite the effort I must make, despite the hours I'll lie awake, this is my task in all this dross, to plan a mansion in the stars and to elevate these slums with a blueprint drawn in heaven. I'll find a space within my prayers where a vision can unfold to replace this ugliness with a blueprint drawn in heaven. 
I need help. Sadie. Oh, Sadie, bless her. Uh, Sadie rests in a homemade wheelchair fashioned from a box and pram wheels. There's a rug across, rug across her knees and she's reading by candlelight. She raises her head. Sadie? Who is it? It's Father Basil, Sadie. Oh, come in, dear. Sorry to call so late. Well, I'm always glad when you visit. Sadie, I have something very important to ask of you. Yeah? Lenny's ill again. Oh, poor little mine. His house is damp and the air is foul. Unless we improve the housing here drastically, he won't improve for anyone, won't improve for anyone here. Love it. It's been like this as long as I've known it. But we must change it. I saw fiery words in the sky telling me that we must renew the ruins left by generations. We'll start, you and me. Help me. I'm stuck in this wheelchair, dear. Otherwise, I'd swing a hammer for you. No, I meant... No, look, I've only got a pension, but I can manage a little now and then. Well, it may come to that, but at this moment, I need you to pray for this work. Oh, I shall, dear. Every waking hour. Every waking hour. I shall hold you in my constant prayer Every waking hour I will pray for your success You who dream you ruins of the generations As you house the poor and the
But who can survive the wear and tear if you wear yourself out on others? Then there's none of you left for anyone. It is early morning in winter in Summer's Town. Knock em up at four o'clock, four o'clock, four o'clock. <coughs> Penny a door is all I got to knock em up each morning. Ah, that's mob waking the workers. Some haven't worked for years. But when they get a job, they're scared of sleeping in. They call me mob the farmer. Run after him, cheering. <laughs> the pain! Why not the streets fighting for a life? I can feel it! I feel it when a woman's in labour. I see the light flip from a stillborn baby. Trouble's coming! He's lit something up a man ago, they'll be missing their grapefruit spoons. I hear ya! Oh my god. Up to Covent Garden on a frosty morning. Just give me a barrow round. Full of rock drossel sprouts and spots. All my life I wanted to be a barrow boy. Except very early on a frosty morning. <laughs> <laughs> Driving a loco up to Glasgow. Wife has packed me dinner tin. Twelve long years I was a fireman. Bending, stretching, shoveling. Now I've had a stroke of luck. Got a proper head of steam Life has changed the signals for me Up ahead the light is green The Cangley Street coal leap Will be all I start I'll have to crack the ice before I load the cart Ernie they say you do work hard Sometimes I feel like a stupid fart <laughs> If I never really use my brains How did I get these chill brains? <laughs> Love grows cold when nights get frosty Kids are coughing something chronic you know as you go to kiss your partner Another mouth will make life harder I often dream of a home that's warm With a roof above that doesn't leak And a bedroom big enough for two Where a love could bloom like a bulb in spring Oh, the summer's town mums are gathering at an outside tent. Hello, dear. You here already? Go oh, after you, then, with the tap. We get up at four o'clock. And we still have to queue for water. Clever mums are 
Oh, a bit of dripping just before bed. Mmm, lovely and simple. <laughs> Father Jellico has returned to the Maudlin mission. It's spring 1925. The doctors say you should be resting. Well, I've had Christmas in Montreux, New Year in San Remo, thanks to an anonymous benefactor. But when I received the children's drawings, I just had to return. The nursery school opens in a fortnight. Miss Lila Daly will run the canteen. Hallelujah, thank you, Percy. I'll leave you to rest. Dear Miss Neville, isn't it time for our housing committee to meet? Well, at the St Pancras Council of Social Services, Edith Neville oh, is composing a letter. Dear Father Jellico, what shall I say to him? That of the men I've met so far, He'd be the one to turn my head. Shall I tell him that? How preposterous. So I'll hold the restlessness of my heart to serve the arts and work for the common good, taking groups thrice a week into the galleries. And when I start my theatre soon, my energies will be consumed, helping everyone, oh, everyone. We need lots of gardens and more window boxes, healthier homes to cure tuberculosis, nurseries for children and libraries for seamen, leisure pursuits for boys and girls. Yet important as these goals are, there are things that only the inmost mind, the inmost mind at dead of night can know. Dear Father Jericho, let us show everyone that this thing can be done. Mrs. Barclay can combine the roles of secretary and surveyor. I am delighted that Ian Hamilton has agreed to be our architect. He is dedicated to community service, mindful of the tragedy at Gallipoli which his father commanded. <laughs> Miss Isabel Nora Hill is a model of gentility, who will encourage the influential to make donations. The Honourable Francis Hubbard is proving to be an excellent treasurer. And of course, we all know Father Percy and Mary Wilson. And Father Jellico. Where's that? I'm sorry I'm late. I declare this meeting open. First, an important announcement from our honorary secretary. The St. Pancras House Improvement Society has been registered by the Registrar of Friendly Societies. <laughs> it's official. We're in business. Things will happen now. The Pancras House Improvement Society will acquire and manage homes scientifically and with structural alterations as necessary. Convert them into dwellings very much improved. So here is a rehousing are quite practical to do. Invest and make a profit, let us hear from you. The old rents remain, but the homes are renewed. That's a nice improvement society. We must improve the houses in Somers Town, though the owners would prefer to let them tumble down. They'd rather have their houses and factories to serve the railways well while people sleep in hell. We cannot let the tenants' rotten houses tumble down. 
say the whole community will buy the town. We'll build a new Jerusalem and be the king. And St. Mike results in room and society. Honorary Treasurer's Report, Mr. Hubble. Um, our opening balance of uh, £250 uh, has been greatly augmented by the, uh, the appeal, sir, 1,500 leaflets sent to Maudlin members and a letter to the Times with influential signatories. £3,534 in one-pound shares have been taken up. <gasps> Splendid! I now call on our honorary architect, Mr. Ian Hamilton. Homes for heroes were promised to our lads. Thousands lie in foreign soil and dream of England. What's that England for which they risked their lives? What kind of homes can ever match their sacrifice? Not the mud enfolding their comrades in the trenches decomposing on their beds of rotting floorboards. Is it space and light like the clear blue sky above the graves at Gallipoli? Sound the call, declare a war on slums, open up a massive front to mop all bugs up, strip wallpapers, and lose the picture rails. Starve them out and don't leave them a hiding place. If homes for heroes has any meaning, let's embody it with thoroughness and passion. And we must enlist truth and beauty to drive out the ugliness. How do we make a start? Landlords won't sell to us. They're running down their properties to sell them as factory sites. We have the chance to purchase the freehold of eight houses in G Street and Clarendon Street. What's the price? £2,800. Oh, big steep. That's too much. They're dilapidated. We must start the ball rolling. The owner is under pressure from sanitary inspectors and may wish to sell quickly. Offer £2,500 for the freehold. Seconded. Harriet. We will need to raise money urgently. Issue loan stock at two and a half percent. I say no. Seconded. Agreed. That concludes the business. Sometimes we're in room and society. We'll now share a tot of tea. Port or Then wearily we'll bend to our separate beds. To dream the dreams on which so many lives depend. I realise what a visionary Father Jellicoe was when he rode on my coal car to view the shambles of G Street. Morning, Ernie. Morning, Father. May I drive you somewhere? Yes, please, to G Street. <laughs> Low budget. <laughs> I want to look at the houses we're going to transform. Oh, transform G Street? That would be a miracle. Ernie, have you joined the Devil's Fire Brigade? Pouring cold water on a good idea? We must start from somewhere. Well, if I was rebuilding Summers Town, I, I wouldn't start from here. I can see new homes rising. In their light, their slums shall fade like ghosts. Ooh. Ah. Lord, let this great blessing flow. House your people here below. Mail, fresh milk from the agricultural show. It's overflowing, get it while it's going. Hurdy gurdy, hurdy gurdy, I fast and wide. Two glass jars, two glass jars for a hurdy gurdy ride. Ice cream, ice cream, this is the best scoop of 
happiness. New homes for old ones, that's what I sell. I will exchange you heaven or hell. Flowers, flowers, fresh in today. Funeral bunches, wedding bouquets. Kippers, get your kippers. Fresh wrinkles here. Bubbles and mussels, they go well with your beer. Salt blocks, salt blocks, six pence a piece. Grab this salt and your dinner's a treat. Like the salt of the earth and the flowers of the field and the fish of the sea, your home is revealed. New homes for old ones, that's what I sell. I will exchange you heaven or hell. The renovation of G Street is beginning, but it's the end of December and bleak. It's cold. <laughs> My first job in four years, and it's taters. Taters? I'll be having some of them. And oh, taters in the mould, cold. Sure. And the pawnbroker's singing for soprano. Oh. His brass balls have froze off his side. Are you complaining already? No, sir, Mr. Foreman, sir. This is an historical building project. Ah, besides, I'll be helping to repair my own flat. Yeah, me too, Mr. Bruce. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, well, I'm not. I could be having another Christmas dinner. 28th of December is the coldest day of the year. Will we be working inside today? No, let's get the housing route weatherproofed first. Oh, here yeah, you've done a bit of roofing. Yeah, I worked with an excellent roofer. He had a scientific theory. Oh, yeah, what's that? Water runs downhill. <laughs> Remember that, Paddy, he says, and you won't go far wrong. Yeah, well, where's your flat? Uh, top floor, in that corner. Well, then you can test your theory up there. <laughs> Billy, I hear you've done some brick laying. You can make a start painting the, the, fixing the bricks in that corner. And while we're waiting for the ladders, you guys come up with us for a workshop, a nice cup of tea. Oh, would you fancy a drop of Jameson in your tea, Mr. Bruce? Well, that yeah. one's down here fine. I don't mind if I do. Irene Barclay has been uh, giving a speech at the uh, St Pancras Rotary Club. Well, uh, talking about the renovation of Houston. Sorry. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I thank the St Pancras Rotary for this opportunity. Are there any questions? Yeah. Why are you going to give these people bus? They want to put coal into them. They'll have a coal bunker. Why put coal in the bath and then have to run to a communal bathhouse? Yeah, and you said the local authorities should demolish slums and rehouse these people. That's just for the rate of it. Ah, and that will be by the price of two tickets for the West End Theatre on one night in the year. <laughs> You'll never get your rents, they're not going to pay. I assure you they do. I am the estates manager, commonly called the Rent Lady. Rent lady, here's the rent lady, shall we let her in? She's awful nosy, yes I'm nosy. I have to survey the extent of their need and poverty. When ornaments go from the mantelpiece, that tells me a family needs relief. And when I see the wedding ring go from a woman's hand, then I surely know soon there'll be no more food for that family. So I beg the state to give them six pence a week. And from that I coax a penny. Then we've collected all that's due, excepting 19 pounds and two. And I don't believe it. From a widow afflicted with a serious illness. These people don't want improvements. They like living in squalid conditions. I shall let our residents reply. Come on down to Summers Town. See the new life we have found. We were feeling down and out. Soon we'll be in clover. We don't want roofs that leak, rotten floorboards underneath. Rainy days don't spoil our washing now. The flats have separate coppers, brand new bath for each family. Try our private WC, most amazing thing of all. Same rent as it was before. We got windows that fit a brand new range for cooking with. 
Turn the taps to get hot water, rooms fresh painted wall to wall, brand new baths for each family, try our private WC, most amazing thing of all, same rent as it was before. Come on, so come on down, down to Summers Town, same living like we have found, we were feeling down and out, so we Improvement Society are having another meeting. Mrs. Barclay has news for us. United Dairies have lost a large island site on Drummond Crescent. Their asking price was £10,500. However, we now have to take two other big sites as well, and the total comprises 69 houses and 10,000 square feet of open space. The total asking price is uh, £27,500. Let's do it. We must. Let's go for the big thing. How? It's a stupendous sum. Indeed. Mr Hubbard, how might we raise the money? With difficulty. Credit balance £5,100. But if we can persuade some wealthy sympathisers to take up loan stock to the value of £1,000 each, we could do it with a strenuous effort. I shall send telegrams tonight to Neville Chamberlain and Lord Cecil. We must write to the Times. The New Statesman, St Martin's Review, and the St. Pancras Chronicle. Why are we doing this? Because it's worth the risk. If we just gaze at it, we'll get paralysis. We want to make a world fit to live in. And there are many more who feel as we. If there are obstacles, we'll find a way around. We can be sure this is a cause that's worth a fight. Let's prove it can be done. We'll get the cynics on the run. We're doing this because it's worth the risk. I've started on the plans already. Our next meeting shall be on Drummond Street, where we will see Ian's plans and be inspired. The site is very extensive. Superb vision, Ian. You've drawn these plans with the spirit of a sanctified lark. Here, here. <laughs> and six supporters have offered us loans. So there's only £3,500 remaining to be left to be, to be raised. Well, the Times has brought results. A leading article backing letters by Lord Cecil and Mr Chamberlain. Good work. Nothing can stop us now. Uh oh, there's a sudden choir as Mr. Hunt <laughs> from the London County Council Planning Department. <laughs> <laughs> there are procedures. You should have approached me first. I have managed to reclassify this area as unsanitary. <laughs> In that event, any of you do would be worse. On the strength of Mr. Neville Chamberlain's letter to the Times approaching the scheme, we made an appeal, and a large sum of money was raised. So why is his own department opposing us? Mm. I shall see what I can do to assist the society. We are ready to commence building tomorrow. <coughs> a firm has... LCC. We must transform Drummond Street. Does this mean bankruptcy? How do I know I'm right? Is it my vanity? If we should fail in this, the whole endeavour will founder and turn that blueprint drawn in heaven to devil's plunder. Have I been wrong to think I could transform this town? Did I not realise we face implacable foes? Let Mammon have his day. I'll keep 
the spirit, my domain. But have I led all our hopes to bankruptcy? Why are we doing this? Because it's worth the risk. If we just gaze at it, we'll get paralysis. We, we want, want to make. 